morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Bean Museum. Uh, today is Friday, so we're going to be doing a Life Science Live right here, right now, for you guys. Um, so if you have any questions or anything you want to comment uh, during the video, feel free to comment that down below, and I will try and answer those as they come up. Uh, if you're watching this later, you can also still comment uh, with any questions or comments that you have, and we'll try and answer those uh, afterward. We'll come back and look at the questions and everything so we can try and answer those, okay? All right, so today for Life Science Live, we are talking about venomous versus poisonous. Now here at the Bean Museum, I get this question a lot. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, is that snake poisonous? Or, you know, is that frog poisonous? And it can get a little bit confusing which one is which. So first things first is we're going to talk about the difference between venom and poison, okay? So, if an animal is poisonous, that means if you were to lick it, that it would make you sick because of the poison. So if you were to bite into, say, a poison dart frog, that's a pretty famous poisonous animal, if you were to bite into that, it would make you sick. Something that is venomous has to bite into you. So for example, like a rattlesnake is venomous because it bites you and that makes you sick. But if you were to bite into a rattlesnake, it wouldn't make you sick. Actually, there are people who eat rattlesnake, rattlesnake meat. So that's pretty crazy. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about different um, venomous and poisonous animals. And I'm gonna try and remind you guys throughout, like this is what poisonous is and this is what venomous is. Cause it can be really confusing and sometimes just hard to remember exactly which one's which, okay? So if you can think of any examples that you wanna comment down below of a venomous or poisonous animal, feel free to comment those because we're talking about a ton of animals, but there's so many that we can't cover them all, okay? We're also not going to be covering poisonous plants today because that's a whole other thing. All right, so just poisonous and venomous animals. But if you guys want to hear about poisonous plants, let us know. Maybe we can do another one sometime, okay? All right, so first things first, uh, let's talk about poisonous things, poisonous animals. Now, poison is kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting adaptation that animals have because it's all relative. So for example, we humans, we love to eat chocolate, right? I love to eat chocolate. I love dark chocolate especially. But our pets, like our dogs, can get really sick from chocolate. There's certain uh, chemicals and proteins in chocolate that they, their body can't break down the same way that ours can. So chocolate is totally fine for us, but poisonous to dogs. So when we talk about poisonous animals, um, or venomous animals, you know, a lot of those things are poisonous and venomous to humans as well um, as other animals. But there are some species that can eat poisonous things um, or certain plants that would be considered poisonous to humans that are totally fine to eat by other animals. So just remember that poison is all kind of relative depending on what animal is eating what. Just as an example, along with the chocolate example, uh, garter snakes, you've probably seen a garter snake out in your garden, and it is a garter snake, not a gardener snake. Um, so the garter snake uh, is usually not poisonous, not venomous. Uh, but in places where the Pacific newt lives, or it's also known as the red-bellied newt, um, in places where those newts live, the garter snakes will eat those, uh, those newts, those salamanders, and they'll be totally fine. And in fact, they actually keep those toxins in their body and it makes the snake poisonous too. So the snake can totally withstand the poison of those newts, but then if a human were to interact with a garter snake that had eaten those poisonous newts, the snake is then poisonous. Kind of weird, right? So I mentioned um, poison dart frogs. That's a really famous uh, poisonous animal. There's actually a ton of different poisonous animals. There's poisonous birds, poisonous snakes, fish, cephalopods, which are things like squids and uh, octopuses, cuttlefish, those are cephalopods, poisonous insects, and poisonous cnidarians. Now, cnidarians are anemones, corals, and jellyfish, which is why a 
over here by our little corals. So not all of those animals are poisonous, but some of them are. And remember, poison is if I bite into it and it makes me sick. That's poisonous. So there are even some poisonous birds. They have poison that is on their feathers, like the oil on their feathers that they use to kind of keep their feathers together. They have that as well. It's pretty weird. Now I have another pretty cool ugh, poisonous animal that I want to show you guys. We're going to talk about this middle butterfly wing right here. Does anyone know what that butterfly is? You might recognize it. This one right here is from a monarch butterfly. Now monarchs are pretty popular because, and they're pretty famous because they migrate every year um, and they go huge distances all across North America. They um, fly and they gather in huge groups. So the monarch butterfly is pretty cool, um, pretty popular. And they also, if you didn't know, are poisonous. Now the reason that they're poisonous is because they eat poisonous plants. The monarch butterfly, including both the adult and caterpillar stages, so their larval stage as well, they eat uh, milkweed plants. That is their main source of food. And they eat all the different parts of the milkweed plant. And milkweed is a poisonous plant. Now, obviously it's not poisonous to the butterfly because that is their main source of food, but it is poisonous to other things. So they keep those toxins in their body they're able to hold on to it and actually put it into their body so that other things that try to eat the monarch butterfly, eat it, like birds for example, they might eat it and be like, oh, that's disgusting, it's terrible, it tastes awful, it's because of the poison in their body. Now the other interesting thing about that, the problem with poison is that it is more passive. So if you were a butterfly, a monarch butterfly for example, and there's a bird, most animals are going to see something really brightly colored like the poison dart frog or the monarch butterfly. That usually means, hey, I'm dangerous, back off. It usually means they're either poisonous or venomous. Now, if we see the monarch butterfly and a bird comes along and is like, man, I'm so, so hungry and I see that it's brightly colored, but I'm gonna take a chance and they eat the monarch butterfly and it's gross and it makes them sick, they're never gonna eat that again. It's like when you eat something and it gives you food poisoning and your brain just says like, nope, can't ever eat that again. It's because we are biologically adapted to know that things that made us sick, we probably shouldn't eat because of things that can be poisonous to us. So a bird might eat a monarch butterfly, it'll make him really sick and he'll never eat another one again. But, kind of stinks for that one monarch butterfly that got eaten. And that might happen to a lot of butterflies, um, depending on how many birds there are that are willing to take a chance on a kind of spicy looking butterfly. So poison can be a little bit more passive um, just because it's not something that an animal can actively use against something. It's not like they can bite into something and be like, back off, I don't want you to eat me. Um, it just works as kind of a whole group. All the monarch butterflies are more protected because they're all bright orange and most birds either instinctually stay away or have learned to stay away from eating those butterflies. Let's talk a little bit about venom. Now, like I was saying with poison, poison's very popular with plants because it is kind of a passive thing. So there are lots of poisonous animals, but there's a lot more venomous animals, okay? And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Let's think about our butterfly again. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's not an active process that they can use to attack against something. It's just defensive. Um, and so plants, for example, the ones that are poisonous, they use that poison because they can't attack any other way. You know, they are stuck in the ground, they don't move, they possibly could be eaten, and it's more of a protecting the whole species rather than the individual. Um, so venom is a little bit more active. It's a little bit more like an attack instead of just a defense. Uh, so let's talk about different venomous creatures. 
Now, like I said, I get this question a lot. You know, I'll be talking about a certain kind of snake and someone will say, well, is it poisonous? Now remember, there are a few poisonous snakes where if you were to bite into it, it would make you sick. But most snakes, if they have one or the other, either poison or venom, have venom. So let's look at a venomous snake real quick. That right there. I have right here a copperhead snake. And this guy is very venomous. They can be very, very dangerous to humans. Um, and one of the ways that you can tell if a snake is venomous or not is by the shape of their head. So here I have this copper head. Let's like take a look at his head here. It's very triangular. You see how pointy the back of his head here is? So it goes and then it comes out to a point right here. It's very much a triangle. Now let's look at a non-venomous snake. I have here a racer. This might look similar to like a garter snake that you've seen before. Look at the shape of his head. Is it nearly as triangular as, there we go, nearly as triangular as the other snake? Not quite. You can see it's a little bit more rectangular. It's not as pointy back here in the back. And so it's a little bit kind of like a thin triangle or like a rectangle. And that's how you can tell whether a snake is venomous or not at a, at a quick glance is because venom um, is produced in little glands in the back of their head. So they have to have room for those glands. So if they don't have those glands, their skull doesn't have any specific room for it. So it's kind of this rectangular shape. If they have to have room for those venom glands, they're going to have this triangular shape because right back here is where the venom glands are and those, they need the space in the back of their skull here. Um, so it'll be really wide and triangular. And then you can know if you ever just see a snake when you're hiking or something and you're like, oh, you probably don't want to get too close to it anyways, but you know to keep your distance if he's got a triangular head because they are going to be venomous snakes. Now, you guys also might be familiar with a venomous lizard called the Gila Monster. These guys are pretty cool. They're native to Utah, um, and they are one of only three venomous lizards. Now I have whoop, my little Gila monster right here, okay? Um, and you can even see, he kind of has the triangular shaped head as well um, right here. You can see he's kind of got that same room for those venom glands. Now the interesting thing about the Gila monster, um, being one of those three uh, venomous lizards. So we have the Gila monster, the Mexican beaded lizard, and then some uh, subspecies of the Komodo dragon. It's starting to come forward that they might also be venomous. But let's take a look here at our Gila monster. Um, he has, there's his little face, little Muppet face right there. He has a very different skull shape than a venomous snake does. Uh, and a non-venomous snake, actually. They all have three very different shapes of skull. So a venomous snake has a skull with two big fangs. Um, if you've ever seen like a video of a venomous snake before, or maybe where they're milking the venom from a snake, you can see they've got two big fangs that come down, they're hollow, and the venom comes through their teeth, kind of like a straw. It just kind of like puts it out through their teeth. So when they bite into something, it goes through those hollow fangs. Now, obviously, a non-venomous snake doesn't need to have um, the hollow teeth that with the venom glands because they don't have any venom. So instead of that, they have rows of teeth, little tiny barbs, kind of like this. They're all, all the way back. So instead of having two giant teeth, they've got little tiny teeth all the way back and they act like little hooks that grab onto whatever it is they're eating and then whatever it is can't get out of their mouth while they're eating it and they can slowly swallow it down instead of having to bite it with the venom. Now, Gila monsters are actually, their teeth are a little more similar to the non-venomous snake's teeth. They don't have hollow teeth and they do have Lots of little tiny teeth um, all along right here. And instead of biting into something and having it go through hollow teeth, 
they have venom glands that produce venom up here in their lips, kind of on the top of their gum line up here. And as they bite into something, they actually have to start kind of gnawing on it, chewing on it. And that gnawing motion, normally when we chew on something, um, it makes our spit glands get really active, our saliva glands. They get really active and they produce saliva. Similar to this little guy. Instead, it's venom. So the venom starts to drip down from his gum line up here onto his teeth and into the bite of whatever it is. So instead of just giving a quick Nyah! bite like a venomous snake, he has to grab on and chew and chew and chew to get the venomous saliva activated. So that's how the venomous lizard works. Okay. Now, there are also lots of venomous animals. Remember, venomous being something that bites you and makes you sick. Um, there's lots of them that don't actually use their mouth to uh, give venom to something else, though. So let's look at a couple of things like that. You're probably pretty familiar with a couple of them. Um, if you've ever been stung by a bee or a wasp or bitten by a spider, those guys right there, those are also venomous. So let's talk about stingers for a second. I have here a scorpion, and I brought it along so you can see up close that stinger in there. Look at that fierce stinger. So not all venom is produced in the mouth. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's a separate appendage uh, for stinging and uh, producing venom. So I mentioned a couple of things that you probably know, things bees, wasps, spiders, scorpions, some centipedes, some ants, cone snails, that's a kind of um, sea snail uh, that is venomous. So there's a lot of different uh, invertebrates which are venomous. Now there's also one that you're probably very familiar with, are jellyfish. As you know, uh, or as you may know, jellyfish uh, have stingers all down their body. They have these long tendrils of stingers. And how it works is the top of the jellyfish doesn't have any of these specific cells, but the stingers have all these cells on them. Um, and they're called nematocysts. Now the nematocysts are little capsules, so their cells are filled with venom and have a tiny little barb on them, so that when, if something's to touch the stingers um, on the jellyfish, the cells pop and push the venom in through them into um, whatever just touched it. And there's thousands of those little tiny cells. So they don't have a ton of venom in them, uh, but they do have uh, a lot combined. It just kind of depends on the jellyfish. Now we have a question from Jeff here. They asked, what is the amount of venom a scorpion has, if I may ask? Of course, you may ask. Um, and it depends on the species of scorpion. So this right here, I don't know exactly which species it is, but this is a fairly large scorpion. And a general rule of thumb when it comes to scorpions and spiders also, um, but mostly you can definitely see it with scorpions, is the bigger, the less venomous they are. So like an emperor scorpion, those are the really big black ones that are like this big, and they've got the huge tail and they're super kind of kind of creepy looking. Um, so they give some people the creeps a little bit. Those guys aren't nearly as venomous as the little, little tiny ones. And let's think about that for a second. If we were to have a really big scorpion, it's probably not gonna be as susceptible to predators. You know, if we have a really big scorpion, things are going to be a little bit more freaked out about eating it because it's big and its stinger looks big, so it doesn't need to produce as much venom. But something that's just little, little tiny, there's probably a lot of animals out there that are like, eh, it's not that big a deal, I can just eat that, it's pretty small. So they have to produce more venom to make them more dangerous. So great question, it just depends on the scorpion. Um, so the larger ones, it, let's compare it to humans, how it would feel if they stung us. I know the larger ones um, can feel kind of nasty, um, maybe like a bee sting, um, similarly, but there are also some that can be really, really dangerous. Um, so it just kind of depends on the species, but that's a great question. Okay, now, 
Let's talk about venomous vertebrates. So we covered a couple of venomous invertebrates, things like scorpions and spiders and bees and wasps and jellyfish, all of those. Um, you're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> all of those are um, invertebrates that are venomous. So let's talk about venomous vertebrates. Um, we talked a little bit with the snake and the Gila monster. Those are both vertebrates, which means that they have a backbone. Um, so, but there are a couple others that may surprise you. They're actually, I have listed here, a couple of venomous mammals. Now, you might, think for a second if you can think of any ven venomous mammals. You might be able to think of one if you already know it. Um, there's actually, I think about seven or eight different species. Most of them are moles or shrews that produce venom with their mouth, similar to the snake or the Gila monster. But we also have, oh, good job, the platypus. That's right, that's one of them. So we have two other kinds of venomous mammals, the platypus and the slow loris. Now the platypus is only venomous in the male platypuses. Um, and they have a spur on the back of their hind leg. So it's not in their mouth, it's actually on their legs and they have a little hook, a little spur that is venomous. Kind of strange, strange place for it to be. But if you think that's a little bit weird, let's talk about the slow loris. Now the slow loris is a type of primate. Um, so they kind of look like monkeys. They're actually really cute if you look them up. Um, and they're very, very weird. They have venom in their armpits. What? You would think that's kind of funny because you know, you're not, it's not like a spur where you can use it to kind of whip your leg out at somebody or like a mouth where you bite something that's attacking you. Instead, the slow loris actually has venom glands in their armpits that they then lick. Um, and when mixed with their saliva, it's what activates the venom and makes it so that when they bite something, it is a venomous bite. So they do have a venomous bite but not the same way that the snake or the lizard did, where they have venom glands in their mouth. Instead, they have the venom, venom glands under their arms that they then lick when they need to have a more venomous bite. So if they're feeling kind of threatened, they'll start licking their arms and getting ready to fight something if they need to. Now, it seems like venom and um, poison are both pretty useful. You know, that's something that you definitely could use on a regular basis. So why isn't everything venomous or poisonous to protect themselves from predators? Well, it's because venom and poison are really expensive to produce. So think about how much food you need to eat every day uh, to make sure that your body stays warm and that you're able to continue doing all the things that you need to do. We have to eat a lot of calories. Animals that produce venom need to eat even more calories to make sure that they have, excuse me, a hiccups, um, to make sure that they have the energy to produce that venom or that poison. Now, since it's so expensive to do, it means that they also have to be really good at finding food. So there are some animals that have kind of worked the system a little bit and they use something called mimicry. If an animal is a mimic, it means that they have those same bright colors, like the monarch or like the, um, like the poison dart frog, those bright, bright colors that say, hey, don't eat me, I'm gross and I'll probably kill you. They instead just look like that, but they don't actually produce any venom or poison. So for example, here are a couple different um, wasps and bees in here. This is a tarantula hawk. You can see like this wasp right here and this wasp, they have those stripes, those black and yellow or black and orange stripes. They're very distinctive saying, I have a stinger and I will use it. So there are certain kinds of other insects such as the bee fly that has evolved to have those same stripes but doesn't have any venom. So he's kind of a little bit of a trickster. Um, one other example of that is the coral snake and the king snake. Now the coral snake is a super venomous snake. They're very, very dangerous. Um, 
and they have red, black, and yellow stripes. Now the king snake evolved to have those same colors of stripes, red, black, and yellow, to help warn something off, be like, hey, I'm venomous, don't come any closer. But actually, it's a secret. They're not actually venomous, those, those king snakes. But they didn't get it exactly right. Evolution kind of threw a little, a little twist in there because it was good enough. So their stripes are actually in different orders. So sometimes we're able to see a mimic that's not quite perfect, and we're able to understand that as humans. But if you were an animal and you just saw something that was red, black, and yellow as a snake, you'd be like, nope, not risking it. Don't want to go near it. But for us, you can remember that it's a king snake if the red stripes touch the black stripes, um, and if it's a coral snake if the red stripes touch the yellow stripes. So you can remember that by red on black, friend of Jack, and red on yellow kills a fellow. And that's how I always learned it in elementary school. So that is a wrap today on venomous and poisonous animals. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to comment them down below uh, about any of our venomous or poisonous animals, um, any questions you have about them, and we'll try and answer those as best we can, okay? Um, but we'll see you guys next week. Have a lovely weekend. Bye!